Section 23 of A Visit to the Holy Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12 of A Visit to the Holy Land, Egypt and Italy, Part 1, by Ida L. Pfeiffer. July 4th. Damascus is one of the most ancient cities of the East, but yet we see no ruins, a proof that no grand buildings ever existed here, and that therefore the houses, as they became old and useless, were replaced by new ones. Today we visited the seat of all the riches, the great bazaar. It is mostly covered in, but only with beams and straw mats. On both sides are rows of wooden booths, containing all kinds of articles, but a great preponderance of eatables, which are sold at an extraordinarily cheap rate. We found the mishmish particularly good. As in Constantinople, the rarest and most costly of the wares are not exposed for sale, but must be sought for in closed storehouses. The booths look like inferior huckster's shops, and each merchant is seen sitting in the midst of his goods. We passed hastily through the bazaar in order to reach the great mosque, situate in the midst of it. As we were forbidden, however, not only to enter the mosque, but even the courtyard, we were obliged to content ourselves with wondering at the immense portals, and stealing furtive glances at the interior of the open space beyond. The mosque was originally a Christian church, and legend tells that St. George was decapitated here. The Khan, also situate in the midst of the bazaar, is peculiarly fine, and is said to be the best in all the East. The high and boldly arched portal is covered with marble, and enriched with beautiful sculptures. The interior forms a vast rotunda, surrounded by galleries, divided from each other, and furnished with writing-tables for the use of the merchants. Below in the hall the bales and chests are piled up, and at the side are apartments for traveling dealers. The greater portion of the floor and the walls is covered with marble. Altogether marble seems to be much sought after at Damascus. Everything that passes for beautiful or valuable is either entirely composed of this stone, or, at least, is inlaid with it. Thus, a pretty fountain in a little square near the bazaar is made of marble, and a coffee-house opposite the fountain, the largest and most frequented of any in Damascus, is ornamented with a few small marble pillars. But all these buildings, not even excepting the great bathing-house, would be far less praised and looked at if they stood in a better neighborhood. As is the case, however, they shine forth nobly forth from among the clay houses of Damascus. In the afternoon we visited the grotto of St. Paul, lying immediately outside the town. On the ramparts we were shown the place where the apostle is said to have leaped from the wall on horseback, reaching the ground in safety, and taking refuge from his enemies in the neighboring grotto, which is said to have closed behind him by miracle, and not to have opened again until his persecutors had ceased their pursuit. At present nothing is to be seen of this grotto, excepting a small stone archway, like that of a bridge. Tombs of modern date, consisting of vaults covered with large blocks of stone, are very numerous near this grotto. We paid several more visits, and everywhere found great pomp of inner arrangement and decoration, varying, of course, in different houses. We were always served with coffee, sherbet, and argile, and in the houses of the Turks a dreary conversation was carried on through the medium of an interpreter. Walks and places of amusement there are none. The number of Franks resident here is too small to call for a place of general recreation, and the Turk never feels a want of this kind. The most he does is to saunter slowly from the bath to the coffee-house, and there to kill his time with the help of a pipe and a cup of coffee, staring vacantly on the ground before him. Although the coffee-houses are more frequented than any other buildings in the East, they are often miserable sheds being all small, and generally built only of wood. <laughs> the inhabitants of Damascus wear the usual oriental garb, but as a rule I thought them better dressed than in any eastern town. Some of the women are veiled, but others go abroad with their faces uncovered. I saw here some very attractive countenances, and an unusual number of lovely children's heads looked at me from all sides with an inquisitive smile. In reference to religious matters, these people seem very fanatical. They particularly dislike strangers. 
For instance, the painter, S., wished to make sketches of the Khan, the fountain, and a few other interesting objects or views. For this purpose he sat down before the great coffee-house to begin with the fountain, but scarcely had he opened his portfolio before a crowd of curious idlers had gathered around him, who, as soon as they saw his intention, began to annoy him in every possible way. They pushed the children who stood near against him, so that he received a shock every moment, and was hindered in his drawing. As he continued to work in spite of their rudeness, several Turks came and stood directly before the painter, to prevent him seeing the fountain. On his still continuing to persevere, they began to spit upon him. It was now high time to be gone, and so Mr. Est hastily gathered his materials together and turned to depart. Then the rage of the rabble broke noisily forth. They followed the artist yelling and screaming, and even threw a few stones at him. Luckily, he succeeded in reaching our convent unharmed. Mr. S. had been allowed to draw without opposition at Constantinople, Brusa, Ephesus, and several other cities of the East, but here he was obliged to flee. Such is the disposition of these people, whom many describe as being so friendly. The following morning at sunrise, Mr. S. betook himself to the terrace of the convent to make a sketch of the town. Here, too, he was discovered, but luckily not until he had been at work some hours, and had almost completed his task, so that as soon as the first stone came flying towards him, he was able quietly to evacuate the field. July 5th. In Damascus we met Count Zishi, who had arrived there with his servants a few days before ourselves, and intended continuing his journey to Baalbek today. Count Zishi's original intention had been to make an excursion from this place to the celebrated town of Palmyra, an undertaking which would have occupied ten days. He therefore applied to the Pasha for a sufficient escort for his excursion. The request was, however, refused, the Pasha observing that he had ceased for some time to allow travelers to undertake this dangerous journey, as until now all strangers had been plundered by the wandering Arabs, and in some instances men had even been murdered. The Pasha added that it was not in his power to furnish so large an escort as would be required to render this journey safe, by enabling the travelers to resist all aggressions. After receiving this answer, Count Zishi communicated with some Bedouin chiefs, who could not guarantee a safe journey, but nevertheless required six thousand piastres for accompanying him. Thus it became necessary to give up the idea altogether, and to proceed instead to Baalbek and to the heights of Lebanon. At the hour of noon we rode out of the gate of Damascus in company with Count Zishi. The thermometer stood at forty degrees reamer. Our procession presented quite a splendid appearance, for the Pasha had sent a guard of honor to escort the Count to Baalbek, to testify his respect for a relation of Prince M. At first our way led through a portion of the bazaar. Afterwards we reached a large and splendid street which traverses the entire city, and is said to be more than four miles in length. It is so broad that three carriages can pass each other with ease, without annoyance to the pedestrians. It is a pity that this street, which is probably the finest in the whole kingdom, should be so little used, for carriages are not seen here any more than in the remaining portion of Syria. Scarcely have we quitted this road before we are riding through gardens and meadows, among which the country houses of the citizens lie scattered here and there. On this side of the city springs also gush forth and water the fresh groves and the grassy sward. A stone bridge of a very simple construction led us across the largest stream in the neighborhood, the Barada, which is, however, neither so broad nor so full of water as the Jordan. But soon we had left these smiling scenes behind us and were wending our way towards the lonely desert. We passed several sepulchres, a number of which lie scattered over the sandy hills and plains around us. On the summit of one of these hills a little monument was pointed out to us, with the assertion that it was the grave of Abraham. We now rode for hours over flats, hills, and ridges of sand and loose stone, and this day's journey was as fatiguing as that of our arrival at Damascus. From twelve o'clock at noon until about five in the evening we continued our journey through this wilderness, suffering lamentably from the heat. But now the wilderness was past, and suddenly a picture so lovely and grand unfolded itself before our gaze that we could have fancied ourselves transported to the romantic vales of Switzerland. A valley enriched with every charm of nature, and shut in by gigantic rocks of marvelous and fantastic forms, 
opened at our feet. A mountain torrent gushed from rock to rock, foaming and chafing among mighty blocks of stone, which, hurled from above, had here found their resting place. A natural rocky bridge led across the roaring flood. Many a friendly hut, the inhabitants of which looked forth with stealthy curiosity upon the strange visitors, lay half hidden between the lofty walls. And so our way continued, valley lay bordered on valley, and the little river which ran bubbling by the roadside led us past gardens and villages, through a region of surpassing loveliness, to the great village of Zaddeni, where we at length halted after an uninterrupted ride of ten hours and a half. The escort which accompanied us consisted of twelve men, with a superior and a petty officer. These troopers looked very picturesque when, as we traveled along the level road, they went through some small maneuvers for our amusement, rushing along on their swift steeds and attacking each other, one party flying across the plain and the other pursuing them as victors. The character of these children of nature is, on the whole, a very amiable one. They behaved toward us in an exceedingly friendly and courteous manner, bringing us fruit and water whenever they could procure them, leading us carefully by the safest roads, and showing us as much attention as any European could have done. But their idea of mine and thine does not always appear to be very clearly defined. Once, for instance, we passed through fields in which grew a plant resembling our pea on a reduced scale. Each plant contained several pods, and each pod two peas. Our escort picked a large quantity, ate the fruit with an appearance of great relish, and very politely gave us a share of their prize. I found these peas less tender and eatable than those of my own country, and returned them to the soldier who had offered them to me, observing at the same time that I would rather have had mishmish. On hearing this he immediately galloped off, and shortly afterwards returned with a whole cargo of mishmish and little apples, which had probably been borrowed for an indefinite period from one of the neighboring gardens. I mention these little circumstances, as they appeared to me to be characteristic. On the one hand, Mr. S. had been threatened with the fate of St. Stephen for wishing to make a few sketches, and yet on the other these people were so kind and so ready to oblige. This region produces an abundance of fruit, and is particularly rich in mishmish or apricots. The finest of these are dried, while those which are overripe or half decayed are boiled to a pulp in large pots, and afterwards spread to dry on long smooth boards in the form of cakes, about half an inch in thickness. These cakes, which look like coarse brown leather, are afterwards folded up and form, together with the dried mishmish, a staple article of commerce, which is exported far and wide. In Constantinople, and even in Serbia, I saw cakes of this description which came from these parts. The Turks are particularly fond of taking this dried pulp with them on their journeys. They cut it into little pieces, which they afterwards leave for several hours in a cup of water to dissolve. It then forms a really aromatic and refreshing drink, which they partake of with bread. From Damascus to Baalbek is a ride of eighteen hours. Count Zishi wished to be in Baalbek by the next day at noon. We therefore had but a short night's rest. The night was so mild and beautiful that we did not want the tents at all, but lay down on the bank of a streamlet, beneath the shade of a large tree. For a long time sleep refused to visit us, for our encampment was opposite to a coffee-house, where a great hubbub was kept up until a very late hour. Small caravans were continually arriving or departing, and so there was no chance of rest. At length we dropped quietly asleep from very weariness, to be awakened a few hours afterwards to start once more on our arduous journey. July 6th. We rode without halting for eight hours, sometimes through pleasant valleys, at others over barren, unvarying regions, upon and between the heights of the Antilebanus. At the hour of noon we reached the last hill, and Heliopolis, or Baalbek, the city of the sun lay stretched before us. We entered a valley shut in by the highest snow-covered peaks of Lebanon and Antilebanus, more than six miles in breadth and fourteen or sixteen miles long, belonging to Kalos, Syria. Many travelers praise this vale as one of the most beautiful in all Syria. It certainly deserves the title of the most remarkable valley, for excepting at Thebes and Palmyra, we may search in vain for the grand antique ruins which are here met with, 
the title of the most beautiful does not, according to my idea, appertain to it. The mountains around are desert and bare. The immeasurable plain is sparingly cultivated and still more thinly peopled. With the exception of the town of Baalbek, which has arisen from the ruins of the ancient city, not a village nor a hut is to be seen. The corn, which still partly covered the fields, looked stunted and poor. The beds of the streams were dry, and the grass was burnt up. The majestic ruins, which become visible directly the brow of the last hill is gained, atone in a measure for these drawbacks. But we were not satisfied, for we had expected to see much more than met our gaze. We wended our way along stony paths, past several quarries, towards the ruins. On reaching these quarries we dismounted, to obtain a closer view of them. On the right hand one lies a colossal block of stone, cut and shaped on all sides. It is sixty feet in length, eighteen in breadth, and thirteen in diameter. This giant block was probably intended to form part of the cyclops wall surrounding the Temple of the Sun, for we afterwards noticed several stones of equal length and breadth among the ruins. Another to the left side of the road was remarkable for several grottoes and fragments of rocks picturesquely grouped. We had sent our horses on to the convent, and now hastened towards the ruined temples. At the foot of a little acclivity a wall rose lofty and majestic. It was constructed of colossal blocks of rock, which seemed to rest firmly upon each other by their own weight, without requiring the aid of mortar. Three of these stones were exactly the size of one we had seen in the quarry. Many appeared to be sixty feet in length, and broad and thick in proportion. This is the Cyclops' wall, surrounding the hill on which the temples stand. A difficult path over piled-up fragments of marble and pieces of rock and rubbish serves as a natural rampart against the intrusion of camels and horses, and this circumstance alone has prevented these sanctuaries of the heathen deities from being converted into dirty stables. End of section 23